Welcome back to the Presbyterian Journey. I'm the Reverend Lucas Levy Keppel, and this is the third part of our series on the theology, history, and polity of Presbyterians. But like a cycling trip across Europe, we can't stop for too long in any one place. So if anything we discuss today leaves you breathless for more, I encourage you to leave a comment and or reach out to your pastor who can give you much more in-depth resources. Last week, we learned about the origins of the Reformation, capital R, and of Martin Luther's role in Wittenberg. This week, only uh, we're going to jump only a handful of miles and years as we move from Wittenberg in the Holy Roman Empire to Geneva in the Swiss Confederacy. Geneva's leadership is desperately seeking someone who can implement these new reformed ideas about government and religion in a systematic way. And so they effectively kidnap a young, university-trained, French-speaking reformer as he tries to make his way back to Basel, where he had recently written a theological treatise. Unlike a lot of kidnapping plots, however, this one comes with a job offer help organize the city into a structure that reflects the reformed ideals of political and religious identity. This man, of course, was Jean Calvin, better known in the English-speaking world as John Calvin. He had trained at the University of Paris and became enamored of the new reformed faith there. But when the Catholic French king started cracking down on the Protestant Huguenot, giving them a six-month window to recant their views or die, Calvin swiftly left his home country and published the first edition of his major contribution to theology, the Institutes of Christian Religion. In the Institutes, Calvin argued that the entirety of human wisdom consists of knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves, and that the only way to get knowledge of God was through Scripture. Images, Calvin thought, were likely to lead to idolatry, worshipping the image instead of the one it portrayed. As a result, Calvin supported the iconoclastic movement that destroyed images, stained glass, statues, paintings, of divine figures. Clearly, Calvin thought there was plenty wrong with how humanity had disconnected from God. He traced it all back to the concept of original sin, that all of humanity is depraved or inherently base, in need of redemption through Christ. This underlies the theology of justification by faith alone. And since faith is a gift from God, it follows that God has actively chosen some people to inspire with faith. These people are the elect, and they are predestined for salvation. Because of all of this dizzying theological logic, Calvin thought that both medieval society and the church needed reform. His goal, then, was to separate the powers as much as possible, since the strong force of sin meant that no one person could be trusted with all of the power. Checks and balances must be in place to keep anyone who has risen up against God from toppling both systems. Additionally, since sin is pervasive, the best way forward is for everyone to work at one task or another. Working is a means of expressing gratitude to God for providing faith. Calvin tried to institute sweeping change in Geneva when he was forcibly employed there, but his attempts to just dictate all of the changes that once were not very well received, and he found himself summarily kicked out of town. By that point, he fled to Strasbourg and met a widow whose temperament matched his. Calvin had famously written, I do not belong to the class of loving fools, who, when once smitten with a fair figure, are ready to expend their affection even on the faults of her with whom they have fallen in love. The only kind of beauty which can win my soul is a woman who is chaste, not fastidious, economical, patient, and who is likely to interest herself about my health. <laughs> it appears that in Idolet Stjörde de Bure, Calvin met his match. 
They were married for nine years, and Calvin adopted her children. On her deathbed in 1549, Idolette Calvin famously said of her family, If they do right, it shall be well with them. If not, they shall suffer, and rightly. <laughs> Strong personalities these two had, but they made it work, and Calvin never remarried. After a few years, Calvin was invited back to Geneva, formally this time, and given a salary that he considered much more than fair. So much so that he ended up giving away most of it, even giving some back to the city. This time he worked with other people to institute the sweeping changes he thought were necessary, and Geneva swiftly turned into an example of what a reformed Protestant city could be like, both for the good and the bad of it. Calvin wasn't the only theologian active in the Swiss Confederation, of course. One who he influenced greatly was a man named Heinrich Bullinger, who became the head of the church in Zurich. He worked closely with other Swiss Reformed theologians to write a joint statement of faith to keep the Lutheran and Reformed churches together. But though the statement was written, it did not end up convincing the Lutherans. And so the Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church remained as separate branches of this new Protestant church. The Anabaptists, incidentally, were a third branch of that. Bullinger spent several years writing a personal statement of faith, which he intended to be read posthumously and presented to the ruling council of Zurich. But when Frederick III, elector of the Palatinate in the Holy Roman Empire, started introducing reformed elements into the churches of his region, Bullinger sent him the draft and also circulated it throughout the Swiss Confederation. This personal statement of faith became known as the Second Helvetic Confession, and was so clearly stated for its era that it was adopted not only by uh, churches in the Palatinate and the Swiss Confederation, but also by the Reformed churches in Hungary, France, and Poland. Most of the confession is about how to live as a Christian, faithfully engaging the world with strong statements for infant baptism and rejecting rebaptism as the Anabaptists were doing, as well as the concept of predestination. Now, let's touch on predestination. While this doctrine is so associated with Calvinist uh, churches today, it originated in the writings of St. Augustine of Hippo. In Augustine's view, God chose from eternity those who would come into the kingdom of God to replace fallen angels and fill up the ranks of the heavenly choir. Only those God chose could turn away from their sin, because God was the one who would grant them grace. Calvin reworked this doctrine. In his mind, predestination is a comfort for those who are racked with worry about their eternal salvation. He was saying, you don't have to earn salvation, it comes from God alone. For people who had been told that they had to purchase indulgences to save those in purgatory, this was a radical change. Calvin's view was that if God has chosen you, you cannot resist God's grace, and God has a plan for everything in creation. In a time where political leaders could force you to say that you believed the same things they did or be killed, this was a grace for those who lied about belief. Later, Calvin touched on the idea of double predestination, that God has chosen some for salvation and some for damnation. This idea was picked up by Presbyterians and led to predestination being the doctrine that was most associated with Presbyterianism uh, by other Christian denominations. Today, though, there is much less adherence to this view among Presbyterians. Instead, Predestination seems to be much more strongly supported by Baptist churches. In any case, there has always been a tension in the Reformed Church between the concept of God's irresistible grace and human responsibility to respond to that grace. I'd like to end today with a quote from Calvin's Institutes of Christian Religion. He writes, All the children of the promise, reborn of God, who have obeyed the commands by faith, working through love, 
have belonged to the new covenant since the world began. This is the comfort of Calvin's theology, that faith in God as God's gift has saved people since the very beginning. Next time on the Presbyterian Journey, we're heading to Edinburgh in Scotland to learn more about the specific Presbyterian flavor of the Reformed Church and how John Knox and the Scots Confession influenced the way Presbyterians worship together. I hope you'll be back next time. Be sure to subscribe to receive notifications of new videos in this series of the Presbyterian Journey. And may your journey be blessed.